Thank you all for coming today. I'm Kirk Selsby. In 1957, Downbeat published an article on Woody Herman that was kind of a valedictory piece, whereby they asked him to give a thumbnail assessment of some of the more famous names that had passed through his band, and it was called Some People I Have Known. And when it came to the name of our next guest, Woody said, he's the most nervous musician in America. <laughs> Not true. <laughs> Only recently has he been able to play less than quadruple time, even on a slow ballad. Why do I need somebody insulting me before we talk? Kirk, shut up. <laughs> I don't need this baloney, I'm came in for nothing. <laughs> well, I believe in the next sentence, Woody was quite complimentary. Oh, I'm going to say that one. If, <laughs> quite complimentary about your work ethic, and of course, it coincides with the rise of the dream band when Woody said, he hustles, and he works, and he runs his group well. He's an example to the young guys on how to hustle. So Woody was clearly, he had admiration for you, Terry. I love the music. In fact, you just made me sound like a hustler. <laughs> what you just said, what did you, you just say? He's talking hustling. about your work ethic. Oh. Okay. I, I am trying to be as prepared as possible before I get on stage. Everything I do before I get on stage will already have done rehearsal. We talk about everything. Actually, what I demand for my musicians is to have fun. If, if somebody has something stupid to say, I will be the best straight man they have had. The whole thing is have fun, but don't fool with the music. Don't, if, it's, if you're reading music, read what's there and don't fool it. But if, some, if you're talking about the dream band, people like like um, Frank Rossellino and Jack Sheldon and Joe Maney, you're talking about a bunch of idiots that always had something to say, you know. <laughs> and so you had to play straight man to those people so you can all have fun, you know. Well, as Mike Melvoin told me about playing for your band, he said, oh, that, the dream band, that was the bad boy band. He said, uh, whatever you needed to do to get on the bandstand that night was okay, just as long as you could cut the music. Yeah, well, that's the most important thing with my band. But well, we got to talk about Woody. Yes, we do. Well, let me say one thing before we do. You know, when, when Ken Poston called me and asked me if I would do this because, seriously, I'm the only one alive. Uh, I'm getting to be where I'm the oldest one in, when I check into a hotel. I'm, it used to be Howard Rumsey, but now I'm the only one. But anyhow, I figured when he called me to talk about the first and third and second herd, I'll come in, I'll be like 12-year-old kids sitting here, and they won't know who Woody Herman is. And they won't know who I am. But it's a nice looking older audience, ain't it? <laughs> and it's a lovely looking older audience. Because I wanna get I wanna get questions. If you all know about the first and second herd, I I'd like to answer those questions because that was probably one of the greatest times in my life playing with Woody Band. Well we're going to take some questions later, but What later? <laughs> I'll fall asleep later. I'm going to be 94 years old. My, my, my wife gets bugged when I say that because I'm still 93, but I will be 94 in about five months. And I'll come back and we'll do this again. You know, you, know, you don't look a day over 93. No, my line is I'm 93 with the body of a man 92. That's what it is. And 
in the mind of a 17-year-old. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Bert. That was a compliment. Yeah. <laughs> but it's true. <laughs> Three, I would love to have questions, unless you have well, really can, something else. I've, I've got a couple of questions, actually. All right. I'd like to get to them. <laughs> now, you left Buddy Rich's band, and in very short order, went home, and you got a phone call from Woody Herman. Could you recap that for our... our... Yeah, we, uh, Johnny Mandel, great ranger, uh, writer, he and myself, and about two other guys, left the uh, Buddy Rich Band in San Francisco. Uh, we had, Johnny went to Cal, uh, down to LA because he wanted to write for movie pictures and you had to have a union card down there and he had to live there six months. The rest of us went back to New York. We only had one driver and about $12. And we got to Las, uh, Las, uh, Las Vegas, we figured this is it. We'll make a million dollars and we'll travel home in the style. Well, we lost that meeting. And the trumpet player, Frank Pinto had a call home to get $100 so we can buy salami and cheeses. And we stuck up that car going 3,000 miles. And when we got to the Holland Tunnel, if you all know New York, it had the rudest people in the world. Our car blew up. The water heater, the smoke going all over in the middle of the tunnel. Everybody ringing their horns and screaming. And we had to get out and push the car through. We pushed that car through that whole tunnel and, um, and probably lost about 20 pounds and we all weighed about 80 pounds. <laughs> and got through there and I swore I'd never ever go on the road again, ever. Everybody went their own way. I got home, I said hello to my mother. I got in the shower, she said, you have a phone call. I got to the phone, half naked, and I said, yes, and he said, this is Woody Herman, would you like to join my band? Now, you got to understand, I was only in my young 20s, and the second herd was all the greatest young bebop players. Uh, for example, I'll, I'll go through the whole band. They were all the greatest. Stan Gedd, Zoo Sims, Al Cohen, Sir Chaloff, and, and Sam Marlowitz with the Saxons, um, um, Bill Harris, and Earl Swope, and Ollie, uh, I forget his last name, and Bob Smith with the trombones. Ernie Royal, Bernie Glow, Stan Fisherson, Shorty Rogers, Red Rodney with the trumpets, Lou Levy on piano, Chubby Jackson bass, and Don Lamont. Now, and, and Ralph Burns, who did the writing. Every one of those guys in that band went on to become either famous jazz musicians or writers and everything else. So anyhow, I, I answered the phone and when he said, Woody Herman, I really flipped out because Everybody wanted to play with Woody. And so I, he says, uh, could you join my band? I said, when? He says, tonight. And tonight? He says, yeah, you can grab a plane. And anyhow, I, I got dressed. I said, I'll go to my mother. And I said, goodbye to my mother. And I got an airplane and went to Chicago and joined the Woody Herman band. So that's how that happened. By the way, I don't want to be pushing my book because of, I'm not selling it. But all these stories are in my book. <laughs> if you don't believe what I said. Did your mother put a sandwich in your hand as you uh, No, nothing. She walked left, through the I, I just walked out. Hello, goodbye. Uh. <laughs> she hadn't seen me anyhow for a bunch of months anyhow, so it was great. What are the questions, the silly questions you have? <laughs> well, you just named uh, quite a few jazz greats there. Um, can you give some, some little thumbnails on, say, Al Cohn, Zoot Sims, and Stan Getz? Well, the consensus was uh, that Al, uh, well, Stan Getz said it. He says, what makes the greatest saxophone player are the notes of Al Cohn, this time of Zoot Sims, and the technique of Stan Getz. Oh. With his sound, made the best saxophone player. Uh, Stan actually got more to play than anybody. Unfortunately, I may just have to mention this. You know, the, the era before me, most of the musicians drank a lot. My era, unfortunately, a lot of dope, a lot of junkies, mm -hmm. and Woody Ben, uh, those three guys, uh, they got straight later on, but they were all junkies. 
But Stan Getz got the chance to play the most because he was the handsomest of all three. <laughs> he, he, he was a cutie, so he got a, what he let them play more. But they all played great, every one of them. Uh, for me, before he died, at that period of time, I thought Al Cohn was playing better than anybody in the country. Because everything Al played, in fact, in my book, I wrote that the three most melodic musicians I ever played with was Charlie Parker, Al Cohn, and Johnny Mandel when he played bass trumpet. Because everything he played came out to be the shadow of smile. <laughs> <laughs> everything he played. When you, when you got on that band, there were two of your bandmates from the Chubby Jackson band, uh -huh. Lou Levy and Chubby himself. Um, Stan Levy said something to me that I recounted with Bill Holman uh, in the context of the, uh, the Kenton panel that Bill and I did at the last LA Jazz Institute meeting. Stan said that in the Kenton band, he never had any help in the rhythm section. But when it came to playing on Woody's band, he said, that band didn't need a drummer. That band played itself. Well, the second heard really was, it was at the time, actually, it was considered the best band in the world. The best band. You, you, when you get what I just mentioned, those guys, every one of them was a great soloist. But what Woody looked for in a band was the ensemble, how everybody played together. And which I'll, which brings me up to, I'm gonna tell you a story about that. We were recording a song called Early Autumn. I take it you all heard that, right? Uh, and anyhow, we recorded this song, and in the old days, if while you were recording and somebody made that sound, you had to stop the take. They couldn't take it out, that sound. So sometimes we would make eight or nine takes on a song because if somebody missed a note or whatever. Anyhow, we made about eight takes and Woody said, this is a rap, okay. Now, after he left, Stan and I were listening to the takes and we, we thought that we both played better solos on the fourth one. <laughs> so we went to Woody's hotel room at Woody's after we got done, could finish uh, half a bottle of anything you had. And so he was a little out there, and we knocked on the door and he was in his underwear. He said, what do you guys want? So he said, look, we don't like our solos on take four. We like our solos better on take eight. So he said, but let me explain something to you guys. The whole band sounded better on take eight. Yeah, but we liked our solos. We have the solos. He said, but the whole band, we sent our solos, get out and shut the door <laughs> on our face. Now the next year, the record came, came out at the end of the year. And Stan and I both won the Downbeat Award <laughs> by, because early autumn. And if Woody would have taken our soul, I'd still be looking for a job. <laughs> because whatever we played, the, the other two solos became actually famous, especially for Stan. It really brought him out. Talk a minute about Woody's... A minute? <laughs> Speak if you will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go, go. Try and stop him. <laughs> Speak, if you will, about Woody's taste and Woody's sense of editing for the band. Well, the most important thing I've got to tell you about Woody, I always call him like a talent scout for musicians. He found the greatest jazz players, and we all learned, sort of taught us, and he teach us, sort of, and then sent us on our way, and we all start doing our own thing, but he really, in a lot of different ways, for me, I learned what a band should sound like rather than solos, because in the dream band, everybody we had, Bill Perkins, Richie Camuca, I go down the list, Joe Meany, Charlie Kennedy, Jack Nimitz, Connie Condole, the Ethel, the Frank Russell, all great soloists, but what made the dream band was the ensemble work, and the arrangements, of course, but that's what Woody, Try to show all of us that when a band plays together, you, you can, it's like a baseball team. It, it's like a, a shortstop and a, and a second baseman learning how to play together at a whole infield. 
But I, I learned a lot from Woody. I thought he was the best band leader I ever worked for. Now, in the Dream Band, Joe Maney kind of straw bossed the reeds, and Al Porcino the trumpets. Who was doing that in Woody's band? Well, always uh, the lead players usually take charge and tell. Well, with the Four Brothers thing, it, we had two different kind of sections. A lot of times it would be five saxophones playing, but a lot of times the things were written for the Four Brothers, the three tenors, Stan Gensuz, and Al Cohen, and Serge Chalov. So the arrangements there, there was no straw boards on the four brothers. Everybody had to play their part, but usually when you have a, a section, uh, it's the lead trumpet player who you try to follow how he's phrasing it. And if you're not phrasing it right, and if you have a good lead player who knows how to do it, he'll, he'll tell you, suggest to you, let's do it this way or whatever. But the lead players usually are the ones. And then the lead player, who led that section? Joe Maney. But it wasn't just Al Porcino, it was Rachel Scary also, because he also split the lead with Al Porcino. I'm sorry, I was talking about Woody's band. Well, make up your mind. You're going to go up there. Come on, Kirk. I'm not 12 years old anymore. I, what you would say about Woody's band? Yeah, okay. As I mentioned, Stan, uh, Stan Myrowitz, when the five saxes would play, he would sort of. Uh, you'd follow him. When the four brothers play, they just play the parts. Okay, well, um, as it relates to your instrument then, the rhythm section was very important to you. Talk a minute about the late, great Lou Levy and that rhythm section. Well, Lou, when I lost Lou and Connie Godoli, I lost my two best friends because Lou and I and, and Conti we went to Sweden, our first big job ever, uh, in 1947 with Chubby Jackson. And we became so close. Uh, Lou and I were roommates in Sweden. We were roommates on Woody Herman Band for a year. In fact, when, uh, let me see. Uh, uh, and then out here in California, uh, uh, Conti moved, I think Conti moved down south more, down to, uh, towards Palm Springs. And Lou lived up here. We were very close. It was just, it was just like losing a brother with Lou and Conti. Besides their playing, which was ridiculous, I mean, both of them were such great players. Just for example, maybe everybody doesn't know, but Lou Levy, the piano player, not only did he play jazz with everybody, but he conducted for Ella Fitzgerald, Peggy Lee. Sarah Vaughan, Carl McRae, Frank Sinatra, Tony Bennett, even me. <laughs> Lou Levy did that in Conti, as we know, was probably, for me, one of the ten, ten greatest trumpet players that ever played the trumpet. So, uh, well, Lou Levy yeah. was God's gift to female vocalists, wasn't he? It was God's gift to females. You ever see what he looked like? He looked like, like Jeff Chandler, if anybody knows that name, Jeff Chandler. Well, they used to call him the Gray Fox. Yeah. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about the chemistry in the Herman Herd. Um, they had a baseball team like many bands. Yeah. And uh, you and Zoot yeah. <laughs> were trying out for the shortstop. Actually, when I joined the band, Zoot was the shortstop. Yeah. And I actually was really a very good athlete as a young kid. I was a very good boxer, which I wanted to be. And I was a very good baseball player, even touch tackle, which we played on, on, on cement in school. And so when I joined the Woody Herman Band, they, all the bands had baseball teams. Harry James, by the way, he was a complete baseball nut. When you went to play Harry James in baseball, we'd show up with uh, clothes that the guys threw up in last night after getting stoned out, and he'd show up with band with uniforms and cleats and all that. Harry Jane was a baseball nut. So, but, but oh, we were Les Brown band had a, a, a baseball team. Everybody had baseball teams in those days. And what do I know about baseball? Well, <laughs> there, it was a source of a, a little contention between you and Zoot. Oh, yeah, when it? I joined the band, he was a shortstop because he'd been there a while. And, and then I said, I play shorts up too. So Chubby said, the best guy 
try out the best guy I can feel, or whatever it is. And, and they gave me the, the job and then didn't talk to me for about a week and a half. <laughs> Which is okay because I never knew what he was talking about anyway. <laughs> You got it, Kurt. <laughs> what do you think uh, Woody's best feature as a band leader was? Say that again? What was Woody's best quality as a band leader? I think I mentioned that about knowing how to make a band sound good as a band. Mm -hmm. Now, you remember all those names I mentioned that were great soloists, but playing together. And I'll tell you what also I learned from Woody, which was great. You know, we get arrangements from, uh, say in the Dream Band, I got this from Woody. I would get Al Cohen, who lived in New York, and Manny Al, who wrote, lived in New York, write arrangements. I would call them on the phone. I would sort of sketch everything I wanted. I'd sing it to them. But unlike having Bill Holman here and Marty Page and Ed Flory out here, which I could sit with them and tell them what I'm looking for, and it's, I, ha I had to rely on them giving me what I was looking for. Well, one time, we were going to record live, and Manny Album wrote a great arrangement of Sweet Georgia Brown, but he wrote an ending that had a, a fade out ending that you would do in a, in a studio where the guy could fade you out, you know? But here playing in the club, I wanted that applause and I wanted that big chord. So I learned from Woody. Woody used to take the first chorus sometimes and put it in the third chorus and take out the second and make it the full one. Uh, it always end big. So what I did, I took the introduction that uh, Manny Album wrote, which he got ending, which like I said, had a fade out ending, and I took the last chorus before that, and I had everybody play it twice, and then I took the chord off of Marty Page's arrangement of uh, Opus Number One and added to that song. And Manny Album thought he wrote it like that. <laughs> because he, he never he never saw it, but he just wrote it on paper and sent it to me. But but I learned that from Woody. So you're telling me, you're telling us. Yes, I am. <laughs> telling us that Woody's band had a significant impact on the Dream Band. Well, it did on me about like I said with Woody. With any band, I, you know, my band actually was patterned after the Benny Goodman band when I first went, made the first record, because Benny didn't have a, 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 a section to play with, so everything was written around him. And so I had everything, uh, at those, especially those days, this is 1957, 1958, 9, it had to be four minute arrangements or less, so you wouldn't get the airplay. And so I uh, had everything written around the vibes, um, if there were any solo, it could be eight bars, Conti, maybe the same thing with Frank Rosalino or Joe Maney, and everything written around the vibes with a big chord on the end. And uh, that's, but later on, what I did when we would start playing clubs and we had some time, I op what they call open them up. I would play up to here, and then I let everybody play, and then have everybody come back and let us see. Everybody play, whoever, and then come back with a D. So this, and then go home big with the last shout chorus. So it looked like uh, I wrote the greatest arrangement in the world. <laughs> but that, I got that from Woody, I must say that. Your band was full of great soloists, but then so was the herd. Yeah. How did Woody balance all those great solo voices? The hardest thing in the world is when you want to open the radio and you turn around to the band and everybody looks at you saying, please, let me play. It's like they haven't eaten in a week, please, give me a drink of play. <laughs> You're looking at all 15 great soloists. Who do you let play at that time? You just have to just go along with what your instincts are. But for me, I had favorite soloists. For example, I loved Connie Condoli more than anybody. So I let County play a lot more than I did Stu Williamson, who happened to be a very melodic trumpet player. But if you see, um, I think it's volume six of the Dream Band album, whoever has those albums, uh, Stu Williamson gets a chance to play a lot because it was the last set of the night, and I let everybody play a lot. Why was Conti your favorite soloist? Because he was my favorite soloist. <laughs> what do you mean, why? Why did you marry that girl? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> uh, but they won because I love the way he played. Uh, you know, I'll tell you what, all seriously. Dizzy Gillespie is my favorite trumpet player of all time. Charlie Parker. I'm a Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, and Bud Powell freak. Those are the three guys that I admire more than anybody else. And Conti had a Dizzy Gillespie feel. He didn't play copy Dizzy Gillespie, but he had that feel. And so I, that got to me more than anything. Parenthetically, Doc Severinsen and I were talking about the Tonight Show band, and he said, I think Conti is my, my favorite trumpet player of all time. Yeah, he, he, he said that to me also on a, when I go there with Steve Allen on Monday night, so when Johnny would leave for the day. Now, as Woody's band had impact on the Dream Band, Chubby's little, little quintet that he took to Sweden that had some input on on Woody's band. You guys did that lemon drop vocal. Yeah, we did that in Sweden. That was that was funny because we heard uh, Chubby was already in Sweden, and we were all kids. You got to remember that. We we never played more than two days in a row. You know, uh, there was no work. We all scuffled. People like him, like Tony Bennett. We all hang out together because none of us worked. And then Chubby had a job in Sweden for 10 or 12 days, whatever it was, and hired us. And, uh, and, and so he went there first. And before we went, we went to 50 Cent Street, Conti, Frank Sokolo, who played tenor, and Lou and myself, and we heard George Wallington play Lemon Drop. And we flipped out over that tune. We went back to the hotel where we were staying before we left to go to Sweden. And we learned the song, because we wanted Chubby to hear it so we can play it. And so when we got to Sweden, um, we got to Copenhagen first, we, we had no access to the instruments, they were on a boat. So we had to tell Chubby, Chubby, you gotta hear the song. We started singing Boom Do You. And Chubby being an old show business, um, he says, that's it, you guys have to sing it just like that on stage. We forget about it, we don't sing. It, 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 we were embarrassed just getting on stage. And, and he, he made us sing. I'll never forget, I think I, I was, Conti and I, Conti, Frank Sacco and I sang it. Conti and Frank faced each other and I faced this way. We didn't look anywhere but at each other. We were embarrassed, we were ashamed. We were uh, singing, and there's no lyric to it, it's our lyric. And, that became a little bit of success, and then Chubby brought it into Woody Band, and then on Woody Band, I, I, every time uh, I'd ask Woody for a raise, he turned me down. I, I, when I joined the band, I was making about $150 a week, and I think the most guys were making maybe maybe about 200 except for Bill Harris, who was making 300 And so uh, I wanted to raise, and then when Lemon Drop came out, it became the ultimate, not for the simple reasons I would, I can't do it now, but I would sing, I would sing that at the end with a low voice and it became a hit record. So I, when I, all of a sudden we're playing it 18 times a night because people were requesting, so I went to Woody and I asked him for a raise. And he said, I, I can't afford it. And, and knowing a little about business, that I learned from my father, if you ask for a raise, and if you don't get it, you gotta quit. You gotta quit. So I gave him my two week notice, which made me sick to want to have to leave the greatest band in the world. And I waited about, oh, maybe about eight days, and Woody came to me and said, I'm gonna give you that, Terry, I'm gonna give you a raise, that made me feel great. Now, about uh, three weeks later, or four weeks later, the record got bigger, and more requests for Lemon Drop for that low voice of mine. You know, the Symphony Sid in New York, when all he would do was talk about it. So I asked, went and asked Woody for another raise. <laughs> I got a twenty-five dollar raise, and I I can't afford it, Terry. So then I said, well, you know what? But well, first, before I said it, I a Charlie Ventura offered me two hundred dollars, Woody. And, and you know, I, uh, I, I'd like to stay, but if I don't get it, he said, I can't give it yet. 
and Charlie Ventura never said hello to me. <laughs> but I had, to, I had to have a name, and it was a good name, Charlie Ventura. So anyway, I waited and waited, and then the day before, the two weeks ago, he came to me and said, listen, could you get out of that job with Charlie Ventura? I said, well, and, you know, having a little brain, I couldn't say, yeah, I can. I said, well, let me call his manager tonight and see if I can. So I waited, waited. I didn't call anybody. I just sat in my room having a fit to, to I can go to Woody and say, listen, Don Palmer says he'll let me out of the, of the thing. And so I got my $25 release. Not for my playing, for that dumb voice. I had a great soul on early autumn. It was, it was my low voice. And who, whose idea was it to name that little vocal trio the three nudniks? That was chubby, the, the, the nudniks. Yeah. That means pests in Jewish. The three pests, that's what we were. All of us. Careers are built on things like this. On pests, yes. yes. <laughs> yes. Now, let's get some questions out there. Oh, we must have some questions. No questions. Yeah, okay, oh, here we go. Yes, Ralph Youngheim. <coughs> hey, Ralph. First, let me say, hey, Ralph. I didn't know you were alive, Ralph. <laughs> I don't think you are. Go ahead. Ralph, pardon me? I don't want to try to I'm still here. Anyway, my question is, uh, what, what's your feeling about Red Garden? Ralph wants to know how you feel about Red Norvo's role with Woody Herman's orchestra. By the way, I can hear okay. But no, I'm going to put that. That's kind of good. Kirk is great. I need these things. Um, what, what, what was the question again? About Red Norvo, was it? Ralph wanted to know your idea about Red Norvo's role in the Woody Herman orchestra. He, Played his vibe. He played good jazz solo. Uh, if you like Red Noble, then it was great. If you like Bill Jackson, it wasn't great, you know. Uh, he, he, Red did what he had to do there. Red, Red was Benny Goodman like Red, Woody like Red. I love Red. In fact, I did something for Red. Can I tell that? I tell the story. You know, Red had a, a stroke, and his left arm got paralyzed. <coughs> But, and there was going to be uh, this boat cruise of a vibe summer, summit, and Lionel Hamm was hired, Gary Burt and myself were hired to be on the vibe summit, along with all 80, 90 more musicians uh, who do the cruises. Well, I heard that Red was playing, fooling around a little bit with the thing, so I invited him, and what was the girl singer that was taking care of Pinky? What was what name? Who? Mavis, Mavis, Mavis Rivers. Rivers. She was staying with him. I invited both of my guests on the cruise. And because at, he was sitting at home and doing nothing, and at, at this way he got a chance to hang around with musicians, even though he was a little out there from the stroke. And, and the wildest thing is, they have a day where uh, you sit around on the deck and you sign autographs for your albums. Uh, there are about 12 different uh, people each day. And so Red sat next to me, and the biggest drag is more people came and asked for his order than mine. <laughs> I invited him as a guest, and he's getting all the people. But the, what happened is I heard he was playing the wrong end, so I, I told Gary, you know, Gary, I'm going to try to, after you play and I play, Lionel was supposed to play, I said, I'm going to try to see if I can get Red to come and play with either the one hand. And every time I tell the story, by the way, my hair stands up, really, because it, it made the audience cry. We got Red on stage, and with one hand, because his left hand was like rubber, he started believing, when you're happy, smiling, da, 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 with one hand, and he played one, uh, maybe about 32 bars of that, then Gary and I came in and joined him, because there were a few sets of vibes, and then we wound up on one set, and I'm telling you, that audience would, were applauded for a half hour. Now, I, uh, Lionel Hamm, by the way, 
you, he can follow Barnum Bailey, you know what I'm saying? He's just that type of act. He had trouble following, I never saw Lionel him have trouble following anything. He, in fact, he started to play and nobody was really paying attention to him. He started telling dumb jokes. And all of a sudden Lionel him became a comedian. <laughs> but but he, he got to the audience because he knew how, but it was the first time I've ever seen him have trouble, but, but Red tore up that audience. I'm telling you, they, they stood up for about, but I'm not exaggerating, five to ten minutes and applauded for him. And I felt so good because he's such a sweetheart of a guy. But I was still bored with him for signing more autographs. <laughs> he was a great musician. Yeah, so anyhow, the, Ralph, did I sort of answer your question? Thank you. I was going to call you. I'm going to call you. I want to just talk to you. I was going to say. Any questions? Any more questions? Somebody has a question. Yeah. Yes, sir. What does the name Terry Pollard mean to you? Terry what about Terry Pollard? Yeah. Terry Pollard. He would like you to speak about Terry Pollard. What was, what, what was the question about Terry he Pollard? He would like to speak to you. Terry to Pollard. Remember playing with Terry Pollard? Do I remember? She was in my band for four years. Yeah. Twin Vibes. Yes. Yeah, and you played, I remember in Detroit, you played at a place called Drone Lounge with Terry Pollard. Yeah. Remember that place? Well, she was from Detroit. Yeah. She, she, we were, she was in my band for four years. That girl, it's very hard to tell anybody how good she was. And the only way I do is I tell her that she followed Horace Silver in my band. She took his place, so you'll know she had to be good. And not only that, but seriously, I don't think it's a vibe player playing today that could play as good as Terry Pollard played in 1953. I mean, she was a monster player. She was my band for the first time I brought her to New York, the first day I brought her from Detroit. We broke in the band, I got her out of Detroit, we broke the band in, in Columbus somewhere for about three days, then we opened Birdland, and Charlie Parker offered the job the first day. I thought I, I found the greatest talent, and I'm gonna lose it, but she stayed in my band for four years. Where did, she was where did she get all that? That vibraphone technique. She played vibes before she ever joined my band. But I'll tell you about the audition. I, uh, uh, Dizzy Gillespie said to me one time, Terry, if you get to Detroit, uh, this is the 50 now, Thad Jones was not known at all. There's a young drunk trumpet player called Thad Jones. You get a chance to hear him, go hear him, he's great. About two years later, I was playing in Detroit. And I had a day off, and a friend of mine who was in the army came down and he said, let's go hear some music. And I'm looking at, we look at the paper, and, and it said, Thad Jones had this. I said, you know, I think that's the guy that Dizzy told me about. So we went to that club, and it was Thad Jones, and Elvin Jones, and a tenor player called Billy Mitchell, and a bass player called Bean Somebody. Do you remember him at all? It's probably the... The Bluebird Inn. The Bluebird Inn, right. Bluebird Inn. At least you remember the club. <laughs> I don't remember that. But anyhow, we, we were having a few drinks at the bar, and I hear this girl playing piano. Now, then we had Mary McPartland and Barbara Carroll of New York, but they were great pianists, but they didn't have that bebop feel, that hard swing feel that Bud Powell had, or Warren Silva. But Terry did, and it was unbelievable because those days the cliche was good for a girl. Today there's four million girls that play better than guys. But those days there weren't. So when I heard her play, I, I, I started a new band uh, going back to New York and I went and asked her if she would audition for me tomorrow, uh, the next day. And I picked her up before she was uh, living in Detroit and I took her to the club where we worked. And when you audition somebody, uh, a piano player, you don't play any hard, you play the I Got Rhythm Changes or Blues, anything that everybody knows. And so uh, we played those. And before that, by the way, I thought maybe because we were drinking and carrying on that, that she sounded that good. But anyhow, I, but she, was, well, she was in the back of me and playing, and she played that good. I didn't believe how, what she sounded like. Now I wanted to hear what she would, how she would accompany me on a ballad, like a, a, somebody would sing. So I said, uh, uh, you know a song called You Don't Know What Love Is? 
uh, in those days, I didn't realize that Terry didn't know anything but the bebop songs. She never heard a Stardust. All she knew was this bebop song that Fat Jones wrote. So she said, no, but I'll try it. So I said, okay, hit an E minus seven flat five. And I turn around, and she hits a cockeyed chord. And I turn around, I thought maybe she didn't hear it. I said, no, I said, E flat seven, my, uh, E flat seven, flat and five. And I turn around again, and one time I get a cockeyed chord. And then I was, now I'm getting mad. I said, I said, E minus seven flat and five. She said, I don't know chords. I said, how are we going to play? She said, why don't you turn around and play the song? Now she got at me. So now I got to I got to know what to do. I turn around, I start playing a melody, and she played all these chord changes that fit that song and even more beautiful, which was unbelievable to me. And then when we got done with that, she says to me, you know, I play little vibes. Now, I used to do a thing with Don Elliott in New York, which was made it good for me, where we used to play five duets. You know, we all, I always had something with Don and I used to be good, and it always tore up the house. So now she told me she played vibes, and I didn't need a really a good vibe player because I wouldn't try to play better. It was just I would show them all kind of hand things. I showed to her that to Steve Allen, and we'd see what, you know, I want to see what she could do. Anyhow, once again, I, I played some piano for her. I played some either rhythm or blues, and I didn't believe what she was doing on vibes. It wasn't just playing easy. She played that, she played as good as I did which was terrible, <laughs> but I didn't need that. So anyhow, I hired her, and we really became that big, and now there is a thing on YouTube, but if you have to get there, it's called Terry, uh, uh, um, G and Terry G P. Yet, with a vibe duet we did on the Steve Allen show, we, she played piano and then played vibes, but you don't see much of her, I mean, you uh, not much playing, it's only, the whole thing lasts about four minutes because it was a TV show, but in the club, I would let her stretch out sometimes and play for five minutes, ten minutes, because everything she played, one chorus was better than the other. She was that good. And some nights if she met some guy and had, had some kind of fight with him, she would take it out of me and really do it. In. I really have to let the piano play play first before I play. I was not going to follow her. She was, she was really that good. But if you watch that thing on YouTube, it's called Terry, uh, 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 Terry G and Terry. You'll see it. You'll see the little bit that she plays, how great she is. Okay. Any more questions? I've got something to have. Uh, are you yawning? Wait a minute. Are we boring you? Tell me the truth. You see that? It's not me. It's him that's boring you. If you're yawning, it's him. My dad put the blame on his head. I didn't even. I would have yawned too. I didn't even bring my gun, Terry. You know. <laughs> Any more questions from anybody? I've got, I've got one off of that. Oh, okay, go ahead. Uh, you told me once that when you hired Terry Pollard, taking a black woman into your band, that was a big, bold social step in the early 50s. Yes. But then the Woody Herman band that you were on that had Ernie Royal in the trumpet section, and it took on... Yeah, but Ernie looked, looked as white as anybody sitting here. Ernie looked as white, he, so you really could tell, and he got no problem. But when Oscar Pettiford Oscar and Gene Ammons... Oscar and Gene Ammons, yeah, you yeah. couldn't mistake those guys. Well, they, they slept in the bus sometimes, believe it or not. In those days, when we went down south, it wasn't Terry Pollard so much who they wanted to beat up, it was me. Because they thought, you know, being in my band, that she was my girlfriend, my wife. It was just a four of us traveling, a drummer, a bass player, and uh, Terry Paul and myself. Luckily, I had a black bass player, so sometimes they thought they were together. But but some, there were times, I'll never forget one time we were playing in East St. Louis. At that time, the club was all white. All these people would they'd be fights in the club when, when they beat somebody up. It wasn't beat somebody up. The guy never moved again. It was that bad. That we finished playing our vibe. They loved when well, you're on the stage, it'd be black or green or yellow on two heads, they'll accept you. But off the stage, it could be a different scene. Anyhow, we finished playing our vibe duet, and everybody's applauding 400 people like, like, and we gave each other a little peck like that. So you heard, everybody stopped applauding. And the dressing room was right at the end there. Now, I, I'm not a street fighter. I don't like street fighting. I like boxing. 
and but I do have a big mouth, as you can tell. And I know walking through that thing to the dressing room, I didn't care if they called me Jew, Wop, Nigger, what, but I, I wouldn't care about that. There's nothing I could do about it. But if it were to touch me, I would have said, get your hand off me and push his hand away. As, as I would have done that, 400 people would have said, what? And beat the heck out of me. So it was, it was kind of dangerous for me, and even for the people in the band, you know. But the most important thing to us is that we were together four years, the music was that important. We all played so well together, and it's like the Woody Herman Band, finding a band that could play that well. We had four of us that for four years sounded that we, you know, you, for me as a leader, we check in a hotel, sometimes we'd have to drive 500 miles just to get there in time to say, what's my room, and grab the key and go to the job and set up and play. And then I have to worry, because I know that four of us, we knew what we were doing. Uh, what I used to do is I used to write 12 songs, I'd write 12 tunes, we'd play them on the job, and then record them, and then I'd write 12 more, I kept writing, and we kept recording the tunes. So we all knew exactly what was going on, so having Terry Pollitt and Herman Wright, and I only had two drummers in the band through the whole four years, so that was good. Any other questions that would make sense? <laughs> or, no, or no sense at all, that's even better. Could we talk a minute about... Well, that was a question right there. Did your dream band ever travel the country playing or strictly stay in L.A.? No, the, the only place we ever played, we went to Las Vegas for two weeks. And and I also, we went, did a, with Miles Davis sextet when he had John Coltrane and Cannonball Adley, we did a one-nighter in, uh, in Phoenix and one in San Diego. I, I want to tell you about that one-nighter because it's funny. Jack Sheldon never play with the band. And that band really was one of the kind of bands that if you did play, get a chance to play with you, you were so afraid because the, 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 that band was so well known in, in, in the California. It was like really the hit of Hollywood and to play in that band was something. So you really were afraid to, to it was like uh, being afraid to get in the ring with Mike Tyson, you know. And so Jack Sheldon, I had needed a sub for, for Stu Williams to hire Jack Sheldon. Now Jack wasn't the greatest reader in the world, but he sat at the end, we, they, we played in the ballpark. The, the bandstand was right where the pitcher's mound would be. And Jack was on the end. And he wanted to do good because he really, he, he thought we were all God in, in that band. And so while we're playing, the wind blew his music off the stage. So he jumped off the stage and he's playing his music from the ground now. And it kept flying out. To, now it's out by shortstop and he's playing out there. Now it's out by center field and he's still playing his part. He played his part all the way until he came back and I cut the band off. Jack Sheldon did well. And he was just the kind of guy for his <laughs> he, was, band. he was the right guy for my band. Yeah, yeah he was a funny guy. Well, you know, I, I, I enjoy having people that like to have fun. But once again, like I say, the music, music, once you start playing, there's no games. You don't play around with the music. When Bill Holman writes something for me and Al Cohen writes something for me, and I accept it and I, we have it down, we rehearse it just like that, that's how we play it. But if you have something before, uh, uh, everybody used to love Frank Russellino in the band. Frank was like the favorite of everybody. If I'm not, you all know Frank Rosalino. Frank could yodel, he could yodel. So what, what would happen, what I would do is when I, I would always tap off the band, so I, here it is. Here, I do this for about like two, three minutes until everybody in the audience is yelling, here it is, here it is. And then I go one, two, three, and I say, wait a second, hey Frank. And I ask him any question, how's your foot? How's your tires in the car? Just anything, and Frank would jump up and he stopped. No, I never know what he's talking about. He's just talking and then wind up yodeling what he's talking about. Hello. And the audience was completely out on the floor and then we couldn't lose. You know, it's like we already won. We should have gone home. And then we played. So the band, it was fun. That band was really something to see in person also. The records do show how the band sounded because the band, Wally Hyde, who recorded the band, 
was, I hate to use the word genius, but he was a genius when it came to recording live. He knew what to do. I've got a question. Okay, I'll give you an answer. <laughs> you got a question? With Woody and, of course, Benny Goodman's band, um, you were playing with two of the three most famous clarinet playing leaders in the big band era, and then later on, you had a long-running association with Buddy DeFranco. For about 20 years. Yeah, right? great clarinet. And then after that, with Ken Poplowski for, Ken Poplowski, for a that's long right. time. You two have a long-running comedy act. <laughs> <laughs> Me when we played or when we talked? No, Ken, Ken and I, Ken, Ken and I really had a lot of fun. Ken is also out in left field. He just out there saying silly things. And, and there's, Steve Allen wrote a song called Flop Sweat. And what that meant was that comedians who flopped used to sweat. So he wrote one of them stupid songs called Flop Sweat. And Ken and I, we knew that word. With a, and when we played in Japan, every time Ken has certain things that he says all the time, I never know what I'm going to say. But every time Ken would say one of his things, and it'd be like dead silence, he would turn around and say, flop sweat. <laughs> we had a lot of flop sweat going on on that stage. You, he and I had so much fun. We just did just now in the coffee shop. We just had a lot of fun. And my wife also. Well, my question was going to be... Yes? <laughs> <laughs> Woody is kind of shortchanged as a clarinetist. Could you talk him up? As a, as a clarinet player? Well, Woody, you know, with Woody, was, he wasn't the greatest clarinet player, but he did what he had to do. I mean, I don't think Woody was really as interested when he had the band, the first herd, the second herd. We never talked about the first herd, which I like to mention a little bit. That was like, uh, uh, at that time, also considered maybe the greatest band in the world. All those guys that were in that band went on a guy called Conrad Gazzo, who became the number one trumpet player in town, probably on every record date and every movie call in the world. Then Flip Phillips became famous, Davey Tuff, and Dolomont joined the second herd, as Bill Harris did also in Sam Horowitz. But that band had some great play, Ralph Burns, uh, Chubby was on that band too. Neil uh, Hefty. That band, and Pete Condoli, and, and actually Conti, Pete took Conti out of well, in the summertime, when Conti was 16, but with no school, he played with the band. Mm -hmm. Woody knew what he was doing. He, he really was, like I say, the best band leader. Do we have any more questions? Yes, Ralph. How about Bill Harris? He got the most money, was he the best player? Say that again. Ralph, Ralph wants to know if Bill Harris got the most money, was he the best player? The best player always doesn't get the most money. Ralph, well, he was a great player, and it was somebody that Woody wanted on the band. You know, for me, who I, if I had a, I paid all different salaries. I never paid the same salary to anybody. My drummer always made the most money because he's the most important man in any band. He is the guy that keeps everything together. If you look at the old bands, Gene Krupa with Benny Goodman, Buddy Rich with Audie Shaw and Tommy Dorsey. Uh, Davey Tuff with Woody Herman's band. Louis All, Dawson. every band, uh, Mo Pertil with Glenn Miller, every big band had a very good drummer. Uh, they, they're the ones that, that time is very important. And by the dream band, Mel Lewis, there was nobody better. Only three drummers, four drummers actually played with the band, but three for a long time. Uh, Mel Lewis for, made all the albums, he's got all since him, and Frank Cap. And then later on, Jeff Hamilton played with the band, and Larry Bunker for a little while. Those are the only drummers I ever had. But Mel Lewis was there for the whole all six CDs. We've got a question over here. Yes. Hey Terry, would you talk about Tiny Khan? Mm -hmm. What would you like? What would you like to know about Tiny Khan? Growing up with him, and you know what things were like. And... Well, Tiny Tiny Khan was a drummer, writer, who never took a lesson in his life. He, unfortunately, he weighed about, when we were kids, I've known, I knew Tiny from six years old. Our witnesses faced each other in Brooklyn. 
until I went in the army, until I was 19, we were together every day and every night. Nobody would hang out with Tiny because he weighed about 300 pounds. And we used to play these games like, you, uh, I'm not sure what you would have called in your area. We called Johnny on a Pony, where you put a pillow against the wall, and a guy puts his head down, and another guy puts his head underneath you, another about four heads, and, and you'd leap, we jump on him, and another guy jump, and everybody have to hold this all up until everybody says, Johnny on a Pony, and then we're off. Now, nobody's gonna play that with a 300 pound bill. <laughs> I'm talking, he wasn't fat, he was big. Well, Tiny and I, if I can tell you what we looked like, because I, I, I was weighed about 80 some odd pounds, or about four, we looked like Peter Laurie and Sidney Greenstreet when we were 15 <laughs> years old, walking down the street. That's what we looked like. But he was the most talented. He set the style of drumming that Mel Lewis picked up. Uh, when Mel Lewis started playing, that style was 80% Tiny Khan and Mel Lewis, and then he, Mel Lewis became more of himself, 80% of himself, but had 20% of the feel of Tiny. Jeff Hamilton got the 80% from Mel Lewis, which was still Tiny Khan, and then became 80% of himself and 20% of, of Tiny, and, and he was probably, uh, in writing, uh, he, when I was in the Army, uh, there was, I was playing drum. I was a drummer those days. I was playing drums with an army band. We would make them army movie pictures, and we used to do pod drives. And there were two arrangements that we used to play. We used to go down to my basement and play with the Count Basie record. Sandy and I would take turns playing drums. One was Wiggle Woogie and, uh, and uh, let me see, and Queer Street. And there were stock arrangements you could buy on all these arrangements, except those two. So I told Tiny that I really wanted to play those, but we have no way to do it. So he transcribed it from the record. Never took a lesson in his life. He heard all 16 notes and, and put it down and sent it to me. He sent me the arrangement. He was, he, if you ever talk to a person like Johnny Mandel, who's probably one of the greatest arrangers, he would tell you that he learned from Tiny Khan, so did Al Cohen, and so did Manny Al, so did all of us who were, lived in New York. And if you listen to uh, the Tiny Khan arrangement of Over the Rainbow, you just know that there were great things ahead of this guy down the line. Yeah, everything he wrote was in the question there. Yes, thank yeah, you. Please. Yeah, they, you, you couldn't do better. I mean, you, sorry, but Tiny Khan, when we were kids, he was the guy that indirectly showed us all how to write by the feel he had. And we all got that. Now, Johnny Mandel will be the first one to tell you. And Johnny wrote, a, by the way, Johnny wrote a great thing for Woody Herman called Not Really the Blues. I think that became a, a standard uh, amongst big bands. Well, I think we've used okay, one up. more question. One more question. Would you comment on Tiny wrote my favorite big band chart, Father Nickelbacker? Have any comments about that chart? Oh, yeah, but you, you know, I, I want to tell you how that band started. Chubby left the Woody Herman band. He was bugged with all the dope, all the junkies in the band, unfortunately. I'm never going to play with, if I start a band, I'll be Lawrence Well, He was really bugged, left the band. <laughs> We're on the road with Woody Band and we pull up to know the studio. It was about like 10, eight, eight, 10 o'clock at night, and some of the guys we got to talk, and they all sit around Nola Studios and where people used to jam. And they said, Have you heard of Chubby's new band? Chubby's new band? What are you talking about? And they said, No, he's in Royal Roos, he's got a band. We figured, well, well, first of all, the Royal Roos was a place that Count Basie played Duke Ellington. What Chubby gonna do with a Lawrence Welk band down here? <laughs> Anyhow, we went down to hear that band, and he scared us all. If you hear those records by Chubby, Tiny Conrad, all those arrangements, and and he had Dal Porcito playing, and yet Chubby got all the guys that that played. But was, it was Tiny's drumming and Tiny's arrangements that made that. Uh, were you here at all when we did? I think we did the thing. Uh, 
The Chinese Con Tribute for you, Ken Woodman. Yeah, we did a Chinese Con Tribute here. I played Father Nick up front. In fact, I think it's on YouTube also. There's always somebody who's stealing things. Who did? Ted Heath. Did he record it? Well, no, that, but, well, Chubby really had a great, you, you know what it was also? The spirit of that band. They wanted to play. There's nothing better than getting either three, five, 10, 15 musicians that want to play and have fun. Mm -hmm. Have fun playing. Has anybody, I don't well, I'm, I'm not going to sell anything. Has anybody heard my last record called 92 Years Young? Well, well that was a jam session in my house that was just, uh, it went to number one on the charts, by the way. It was just, I never knew I was, I, I, when I was asked by the record company to record, uh, they were going to pay everybody fairly well, and my son arranged the whole thing. Uh, I, I wrote out about 15 tunes that I like to maybe jam. I don't think I played two of them. I finished playing the song, and I said, let's play how I do. Let's play. It was a jam session, and I played as I wanted to play. I never heard what I played because my, this guy bought my son one of these $7,000 recording machines and a 29-inch um, uh, uh, computer. And my son is great with the set the levels at the right place. And we just played. We played and laughed. Played and laughed and played and laughed. And that was, I, I wish we could have put, uh, besides the music, I wish we could have put some of the in-betweens of us stupid things we said because that, that, we can do a whole, whole record just on that alone. You get four guys who are having fun playing, you'll hear the silliest thing. It's great. Well, it's been more <coughs> than fun speaking with you, Terry. Uh, uh, that's a good story. I thank you very much. <laughs> Kurt Sylvie, you're great, Kurt. I don't care what anybody says. <laughs> Thank you, my wife will appreciate that. Uh, now to get off the stage. I'll help you. I'll help you. Help me, better put me on your shoulders. Yeah, that's what I was thinking.